Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosnan of Steve Brosnan's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand and watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And it is Monday, April the 26th, 2021. This is the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 94. My name is Clyde J. Kale. Once again, I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everybody. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. And, um, this week I decided to, uh, it's going to, I'm going to call it like a tribute podcast to American artist, uh, Richard Schmid. Uh, he passed away last week on April the 19th. And, uh, that was actually had, I, I didn't find out till, till later on Facebook. I saw a posting that they had passed away. Otherwise we would have done this last week, but we're, we're not too late. And there really wasn't much. There wasn't any uh, documentaries about him uh, or any, just a few uh, links. If you go to www.talkartpodcast.com, talkartpodcast.com, I've got some uh, uh, short videos uh, his daughter and his uh, grandchildren had put up some uh, tribute. So a little bit about him. Plus he was uh, given back in 2014, I guess he was awarded the uh, lifetime achievement award from the uh, plain air society. Diane, you want to add to this? What what was that all about? Well, Richard has been a driving force, I guess, not just in plain air work, but also in um, Ala Prima. That was his, his um, specialty, I guess. Um, He's been around for, well, he had been around forever, and a lot of top painters in the country had studied with him or were influenced by him in some respect. Um, He was always on my bucket list of somebody that I wanted to learn under, you know, but unfortunately, that that never happened, but um, I, I mean, I have his books, a couple of his books, and I have a couple of his tape, the video DVDs. And um, I have learned under, you know, from him, I guess, from those. And his books are really um, a wealth of information for anybody that, you know, wants to learn how to paint. Um, he was uh, somebody that a lot of people learned from. And he had a, a group in, in Vermont um, called the Putney Painters that he worked with. And, um, well, he had lived in several different areas, but... He uh, 
the last few years, I guess he's been, he was, had been in up in Vermont and he had this group and there was, there's a lot of top painters in that group. And, but the videos that you had posted showed what his personality was like. He was just a great person, person or be around great fun. He always wanted to have, um, yeah, people enjoy what they were doing and, um, just have fun, you know, and, and enjoy life and sharing and teaching and everything. That, that was his main focus is teaching other painters how to be better painters. So, um, but yeah, he was, he was, he's going to be greatly missed. I that from, from the prisons across places <laughs> and uh, other places. I, uh, when I, you know, the first post, I mean, I, I had never heard of him. Of course, I haven't participated in the a la prima or plain air organization communities, you know? So had I been more of a participant, I probably would have heard of him. But uh, so I had to do some research when, you know, so many accolades of uh, about Richard Smid uh, was coming. I said, well, who is this guy? You know? And, <laughs> and there was, you know, just a few scant, uh, videos on YouTube, but the videos, they, what impressed me, the reason why I selected them, they, they really showed his personality. I mean, him and his wife, you know, uh, dancing. And these were videos that from what I could see the posters, they were from his children and his grandchildren that they've had that. And, and other people that had been like in his group painting with him, <clears throat> a lot of those people, um, recorded, you know, his sessions and, <laughs> and, um, you know, it always seemed like they had great fun <clears throat> and they learned a lot. I mean, he was very sharing. That That's what and the last video is about 40 minutes long. It's uh, one of the artists. Uh, what was his name? Carl, Carl Hunter. Charlie Hunter. Charlie Hunter. Yeah. Charlie Hunter. A, a participant and a student. And he did a, a tribute podcast you know, and was showing pictures as he was talking but he described it exactly. He says, so there was no, he said, maybe some people may say it's a little corny sometimes when they come here, but it was fun. And he said they would actually have some serious philosophical discussions during lunch. And then somebody would bring up something off the wall and then they would go down the beaten track. <laughs> and we completely lose everybody to the concentration of that serious philosophical co art conversation. <laughs> and I, that to me, that, that appealed to me, you know, I said, okay, yeah, I guess I, if I was part of that group, I would, uh, I would enjoy that, you know, and I'm not a group person, but something like that. I think he, uh, and the thing about it is, uh, you just didn't show up. Uh, you had to be invited in that, that Putney, uh, painters group. Putney painters. Mm. It, it yeah, they kept it fairly small, and and um, yeah, you know, they had a more intimate relationship, and everybody knew each other, and all that kind of stuff. So it's yeah, and uh, <laughs> but that but it was like the first Saturday, you know, or something, a, a Saturday of a month, and uh, you know, uh, all day long. Yeah, you know, it was an all day affair. Yeah, you, know, you would paint for a little bit, you would talk a little bit, and they have lunch. Then they go back and paint some more. <laughs> and for some of the show him, you know, we're at these sessions where other people had recorded, you know, where he's uh, painting his, uh, you know, his, his technique, you know. And, and uh, um, I wish I had known more about him before, you know, but now I have to, it's all secondhand. I have to learn, you know, learn about him. Constance, did you know who Richard Schmidt was or you, you know about him? Uh, yeah, I didn't know him know about him that well, but I have seen his books on Amazon. I don't have any of his books, and um, I went to look to see about maybe getting one of his books, and they have kind of gone sky high after his after his death. Uh, but watching those videos, he seemed like a really nice person to learn from. It's always to have a, always nice to have a good mentor to learn from. Um, I can think back when I was learning to paint in my younger years from mentors that I took from it. And that's always nice when you have a teacher who's really fun to learn from. Um, I had a few of those while I was learning to paint and it was really great. Um, so 
Yeah. When he was, I guess when he was awarded the, uh, uh, life lifetime achievement award, uh, back in 2014, uh, he was, you know, what 80, 80 something. He was in his eighties then, and uh, he had been having health issues. So he couldn't go to, to actually personally receive the award, but his daughter went on his behalf and, but he made a, a, a short little video, you know, thanking the committee and the group. And I liked his, you know, he really pushed his emphasis of uh, painting a la prima and painting plain air that uh, he says, it takes quite a bit of mastery for an artist to paint, to learn how to paint plain air. And that when you are able to achieve it to superb effect, you're at your, by that time you are usually at the high point of your art career. Mm -hmm. That kind of, that, that interests me a little bit, you know, is because you, know, you hear so many other people talk about, you know, plain air, plain air, and all the prima, and you know, all, and uh, there's all, oh, if you do a search on, on YouTube, oh my God, there are so many videos about it. It's unbelievable. You could spend hours and hours and hours and still not learn anything. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, his well, main was thing was to wor be working from life. And, mm -hmm. and that's you you do get a lot more out of what you're doing if when you do that whether it's a still life or outside you know out in the in the landscape but um when you have that experience and that's another thing he talks about is um not just painting what you see but also painting what the experience means and getting that emotion into your work and that's something that appealed to me Absolutely. That, yes. When he gave, when he talked about that, that, that especially, uh, that ring a bell. Man. Okay. That's kind of my objective. You know, I'm still not, I see myself headed for doing a uh, painting from life and maybe doing some plain air. I'm not there yet. I'm not, you know, uh, but I'm working, I'm working my way there. Uh, there's still quite a bit that I can learn uh, from a studio practice, you know, working from photographs, you know, and, cause you still have to, I use my imagination. I don't paint exactly as I see. I, you know, I, I, I get the rendering down, but then I also, uh, you know, throw in some imagination in, but, um, um so I'm, I'm building my foundation before I jump out and, uh, do, uh, you know, some plain air. Painting from life in inside a studio also is something that I've done a couple of things, but I, I don't have the, the setups yet, but it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Just, you know, putting things together to, to, to where I feel like I'm going to reach that certain point. Constance, you was going to say something like I cut, cut you off. Then I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that I have gotten to a point where I like to paint, paint Ella Prima. I, I, a lot of times if I don't finish it the first round, I'll just snatch it off the easel and start something else up um, instead of going back and working on it again. I, I don't know if it's because, you know, I'll end up with a headache and I, it dries before I can work on it again or something happens, but um, I'll go back and, but I like to finish it the same in one sish setting, but I've started painting smaller too. So that, makes it easier to finish in one setting so yeah i'm still you know for these these lessons that uh you know this course because they're all a la prima and the emphasis the emphasis is, is in one setting so i'm following that and learning to you know what i can cut out and what i can't cut out and you know, trying to train my eye to be more exact for that that's helping there but i've been kind of like experiment and, I, and I'm co I've come up with a, with a combined uh, technique with regards to oil paint. And it's not a hundred percent fat over thin. It's not a hundred percent block everything in and then slowly build up, you know, the, 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 you know, la prima, you know, wet on wet on top of that. It's not a hundred percent glazing. I I'm doing a combination of, of all three, the last step is the, uh, uh, the thick and a little bit of, 
of the you know all all you know all the prima. So that's not technically all the prima wet on wet from start to finish, but it's 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 a uh, it's it's working really well for me. My last two pieces that I, I did this weekend were just I was just so much fun, you know, the, the horse and a donkey, and they were just but they were they were like that and uh i'll say a little bit of uh richard smith i uh, i i read some of his stuff and i watched a few short clips of his painting maybe he uh he kind of influenced me on those a little a little bit there you know and uh, yeah i was working from photographs but you know cuz i didn't have a donkey in the house or a horse <laughs> oh I, come on <laughs> you sure <laughs> Even though I had people thought they had, they, I actually had a comment. Somebody said, "What? Do you have that donkey?" And, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to send you some pictures of mine. That's why I said I was thinking of yours when I was looking <laughs> at a picture of a donkey, and I was thinking about you. You're those two you got with the little haircut, Beatles haircut, like yeah, I've got four of them. They're just so cute. And so I, you know. So I was looking through, uh, you know, the Pixabay service, ro- royalty-free photographs. So I wouldn't get in trouble, you know. And I came across that that hilarious donkey, where you know, and, and immediately the title jumped in my head. Hi, y'all! <laughs> <laughs> Sudden accent. I just it popped in my head because he's he's got like a smile, you know. <laughs> it looks like a smile on his face. You know, he's looking out of, out of his barn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It just captured, so cute. Yeah, it just captured my attention. I said, okay, I got to see what I can do with this guy. And yeah, I was <laughs> about a week. You know, of course, using that uh, Merge uh, medium, you know, it dries quick. So mm-hmm. you know, the, the first the first layer, you know, I put down, you know, thin, mostly Merge, you know, and that's uh, and that dries, you know, usually overnight or within a couple of days and then I can start adding some more to it, more things to it and to do a little bit of glazing on certain parts of it. Then that drives two or three days. Like I started on this thing last weekend. I think it was last Saturday, not just past Saturday, but a week ago Saturday. And then I finished it up and you know, that's, uh, you know, one of the advantages of uh, using that uh, as the French marriage, but most Americans call it, Maruger. <laughs> Maruger. I've never heard anybody call it that. Maruger. <laughs> the way it's spelled. M-A-R-O-G-E-R. Maruger. <laughs> I, was never, I never heard anybody call it that. That's what I started calling it until, until uh, uh, Kelly pronounced it's American. <laughs> okay. I get everything. A merger. Yeah. Maruger or merger. <laughs> what the <heck? laughs> Uh, oh. <laughs> okay we got anything else to say talk about uh, because uh folks it's shocking but i'm not the expert this time <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> either, other than what i've read and what i found online <laughs> diane seems to be the expert she has his books how much does his book cost you diane of course oh I've, i have i've had it for years i don't even remember what i paid for it. i know it was expensive at the time for me I don't remember what it was, it was like a hundred dollars or something like that. I don't remember. The ones that I saw on Amazon were well over a hundred. There was nothing under a hundred I saw on Amazon because I was going to try and get one, but they were, and some of yeah, them check were out, like, he, he has them on his website. 500. Go to his website and see what they are there. I, I haven't looked yeah, lately, but I'll have to go. Yeah. I put, they were expensive. In the links. If you, if anybody wants to check that out, it's uh they are expensive, but they're well worth it. There's a lot of information in them. Oh, really? Okay. And, uh, uh, well, describe what's some of the information, what's some of the tips that that he gives us? Um, well, he talks about um, his color charts a lot, and that's just learning how to mix color. But he, he took his all the colors that are he has on his palette and he made a chart of each color and a little block of each transition from um, the color out of the tube and then he added 
very um, varying amounts of white to it to get different shades. Mm -hmm. And then he added um, each other color that he had on his palette to it and got the net, you know, like um, an example, uh, like a yellow and a blue. And he'd get a green. Yeah. And then um, he would take do the same thing with that green. He'd add different amounts of white to it and to, to get the different shades. So he had a whole chart of what colors he could mix, um, just basic one on one color in his own uh, and then he has these charts and so he could use his chart to see what colors he needed for his like if you were going outside to do a landscape painting he could hold his chart up and see which colors match that landscape so he knew exactly which colors he needed to use to get that painting okay mm -hmm. so having like a like you know uh, some artists especially you know i've i've seen a lot of art teachers do this they have like a like a, a standard palette a, a standard uh uh palette you know of, of grouping of colors and and brands that they use all the time for all their work mm -hmm. that's what they're, they're working on so he didn't do that then he because uh, different brands of paint makes different you know different color well colors. he he had certain ones that he liked that he always had on his palette Okay. I mean, he. I mean, he's just like anybody else. He'd try other things, you know. Th you know, somebody would tell him about a color or something, and he'd try a different thing, and it might work for a particular painting. But he had his standard colors that he kept on his palette. And that's the same thing I do. I've had the same colors on my palette for forty years or more. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, I might try something else and see what you know what it gives me. But um, but you know. It, when you get to really know your colors on your that you have and how they mix together with the other colors mm -hmm. you uh it's kind of like a shorthand you you don't have to think so much about what you're how to get a color you just automatically grab something and you know what it's going to give you yeah so so doing the charts and and spending time mixing just mixing color like that is really valuable it, it's, yeah. it's a shorthand. It makes everything go faster when you're out there doing, especially when you're in a landscape, because you gotta you gotta paint fast when you're out in the landscape. Yeah, because light yeah. changes so fast. So you gotta know you know what to grab <laughs> that'll give you the right the color you want. Wow. You don't spend so much time. Sounds like a lot of work. Right away when I heard about that making color. <laughs> Uh, my eyes glossed over. It is a lot of work, but it's it's worth doing it. Really, it, it, you real, yeah, it is because it's, you 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 really learn what your colors will do, and how and how to do it, like how to get it. You know, if you're looking for a particular color, instead of just experimenting and grabbing something and hoping it'll work, you don't have to do that because you know exactly which ones will give you the the right color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I have. I have accidentally mixed up. I mean, when you don't know what your colors will do, you can accidentally mix up too much of a pile of color that doesn't work yeah. for what you're going after. And then you have to take it and scrape it off and start over again because you haven't gotten the color that you want with what you've mixed okay. instead of just fighting. You're fighting with your color instead of. Okay. You know, I, yeah. Yep. That's why we have the Artist Friends podcast. These two are five. <laughs> but I can see I, I'm now that I'm doing more oil paint. I'm 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 starting to encounter quite a bit because I was thinking of this work I I uh, uh, was uh, working on. Like I was excited about painting that donkey. Okay, the donkey has a bit of a blue tint to it. So okay. I knew my, my ultramarine blue would be too dark. So I wanted to, to give it that blue tint. So then I mixed that with the zinc white. And of course the, the zinc white turned into it's still baby blue. No, he's not. <laughs> he's uh, yeah. So I had a pile of uh, blue and white paint that I didn't use. That was waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, that's what happens. You keep adding things, hoping it'll change it. But you, and you don't know what the colors will do, you end up with a big pile of something you can't use. Yeah. So 
you know, it's kind of frustrating. I mean, there is some value in that, but you don't end up with getting usually what you're looking for. And you end up with wasting a lot of paint. <laughs> that, that so. I couldn't do it at all. Or, uh, well, maybe if I was going to work on another piece, I might have, but on that particular piece, no, it wasn't going on for the donkey. It was too blue. So, I, mm -hmm. you know. I needed to figure out another method. That's when you get one of those little jars that seals up really good, and you scrape it off and put it in there, <laughs> and then you end day. up with a nice gray <laughs> later on to use as something. <laughs> now, <laughs> Mc, uh, what's his name? Is his name McPherson? Kevin McPherson, who does painting, he suggests that you save all that old paint, and then you mix it up really good and put it in a tube, and you can use that for a gray color. Okay. <laughs> okay. I do that sometimes when I'm cleaning my palette off. I'll just save up. I'll, I'll just scrape the whole thing and mix all the stuff together, and it'll mm -hmm. give me a nice gray or a brown mm -hmm. usually. And I can use it to start another painting or you know whatever. Yeah. So I don't waste it because it is yeah. you know it, it can get pricey. <laughs> it does start throwing paint away. <laughs> yeah. Means art. That's right. Yep. I mean, I'm not painting as much as what some other people do, but they're still, for me, paying six dollars to ten dollars for a tube of paint. That's expensive for me. Yeah, when you're buying the CADs, they're forty dollars a tube. Yeah, I know. That's all that. <laughs> okay. Well, if that is about uh, about it, I think we're out of time, and we can wrap this up. I hope our listeners enjoyed this, uh, our discussion about uh, Richard Smith. That's uh, S C H M I D. And uh, when I first heard his name, I thought everybody was saying Smith. And I found a guy by the name of Richard Smith, but that wasn't this guy. He, he was some kind of a science, theoretical scientist. I said, nope, that's not him. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to check the spelling of his name again. But the Richard and then S C H M I D. And of course, the links and more information about uh, Richard is available at www.talkartpodcast.com. That's talkartpodcast.com. You've been listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 94 for April the 26th, 2021, our last one for April. Here we are. May is around the corner. And. It is. I'll be saying, I'll say bye-bye to Diane and Constance. Will that Con uh, uh, Diane say bye to everybody? Good night, Clyde. Good night, Constance. Good night, everyone. And Constance. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Yes, I second that. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, uh, send us an email, cjkl at sign mystery dash otr dot com. If you have a particular subject or an artist you want to hear us talk about, send us an email. And we'll see you next month. Bye-bye, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kill at www dot cjkaleartworks.com If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery dash otr dot com If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or a star rating and most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License.